Hello and welcome to Business Today Television. I am Siddharth Zarabi and with me one of the foremost names in Indian business and in the renewable energy space, Suman Sinha of Renew Power. Suman, thank you very much for being here. The sun is out uh, and it's recharging all our batteries. Uh, but before we get into that space, uh, I want to start by uh, getting your sense of how uh, uh, the global economy is doing in crucial geographies and you have experience of the, uh, that as well because the sense we are getting is the worst seems to be behind us. Last year the mood was far more pessimistic yet global CEOs are far more pessimistic than their Indian counterparts. That's what the latest study tells us. So how is it shaping up according to you? Yeah, thank you Siddharth. It's terrific to be here with the sun on our backs. <clears throat> uh, that's actually making it warmer so we can actually sit here with our jackets. <laughs> But uh, look, I think uh, in, in a sense, I think that's what we are looking for in 2024 as well, which is the sun behind our backs a little bit. Uh, the big thing that has happened or that has changed is that last year, there was a lot of uncertainty about the U.S. interest rate environment and the general interest rate environment in the Western world. And that was leading to a, leading to a lot of risk off sentiment. Uh, capital intensive sectors were getting impacted, particularly renewables, for example, uh, and there's a lot of uncertainty about when that situation might be reversing itself. What we are now seeing is at the end of last year, when uh, uh, the Fed, the U.S. Fed decided to pivot a little bit, I think now the conversation has switched to when our interest rates going to start coming down and how much will they come down by this year. And I think that itself is leading to a very significant change in sentiment among the financial investing community, because what that means is that uh, that fixed income, that is debt assets, suddenly become more attractive mm -hmm. and you'll start seeing the ability of various companies to raise capital in the debt markets going up. You'll also see a lot more positive sentiment on the equity markets as equity markets are beginning to rally. Mm -hmm. So I think all of that is very positive. The other good thing that is happening is that given the fact that the U.S. has not gone into a recession so far, there is a very clear view that is now building up that this might actually be a soft landing scenario. Mm -hmm. And that obviously is positive for everybody, because, including India, because it means that our external sector will continue to do well. And, um, and, and therefore, the overall environment from a macroeconomic standpoint is looking a lot more favorable this year than it did uh, last year. And uh, I think by the second half of this year, we'll see much more normalcy prevailing in capital markets. And I think business sentiment is going to be a lot more positive. One of the uh, facets of the recent past has been energy inflation of the kind that, uh, that people haven't seen, especially in the developed world. Uh, your thoughts on that and whether uh, the, a reversal to that situation uh, would impact the renewable energy space? Because obviously when prices of petrol and diesel and other things go up, there is greater renewed interest in uh, the green energy space. Yeah, so look, I think that uh, energy inflation had already started reversing last year and you saw that uh, uh, prices globally of oil have stabilized sort of in the 70s uh, range, $70 per barrel range. And I think that's likely to continue this year. And keep in mind that the global economy has weathered a couple of very significant wars that are going on right now, right? And both have an impact on the oil markets, yep. right? And now we are, of course, seeing the whole thing happening in the Red Sea with the Houthis and so on. But still, oil prices have stayed relatively stable. And I think that's, that's a real positive for a country like India. Now, what is the impact on renewables? I think renewables are on, on a track of their own. Uh, because uh, Also I, because of climate. and uh, Primarily because of climate and, of course, the fact that <clears throat> costs are down. And keep in mind that we don't so much compete with oil and gas as much as we compete with coal. Because coal is the thing that produces the electricity, context, right. and uh, to some extent even uh, globally. But you're right, gas is, is the thing that people look at more globally. Uh, but I don't think that the two are really that deeply related any longer. I think anything between a price of 50 to 100 of oil and gas in some ways doesn't impact renewables one way or the other. And now at G20, under India's leadership, the G20 uh, adopted a declaration of trying to triple renewable energy capacity by 2030. That was further um, adopted at the COP28 as well in Dubai, where almost 120 countries have signed up to that pledge. Mm. So I think uh, if any of those pledges are eventually met, then renewables will have a significant growth in any case. Uh, in terms of uh, the successes that we have seen uh, in India, uh, what has really contributed? Some states doing very well, some not doing uh, uh, that well. Uh, it's a 
bit of a mixed uh, picture. How would you describe it? You know, I would say that uh, the central government, on its part, has been very categorical that they want to press the pedal on renewable energy. Mm -hmm. Right? That has been very clear. And they have come out with a number of policies over the last uh, few years that have been very positive for the sector. For example, allowing us to use the interstate transmission network without having to pay for it till mm -hmm. June 2025. And now for green hydrogen, allowing any projects commission till 2030 to have that same benefit. I mean, that's, a, that's a big benefit. The second, of course, was creation of the central government entities that are carrying out auctions and are acting as an inter intermediary between us and the discoms. Mm -hmm. Essentially, in some ways, um, you know, insulating us from the, exactly, from the discoms, right? So even if the discoms can't be reformed, at least we are no longer as a corporates exposed to them, right? So that's another very big change that the government has done. I think that uh, <clears throat> going forward, the biggest, and, and just one more thing, this year, by the way, mm -hmm. the financial year 2024, the government has already auctioned off close to 40 gigawatts of renewable energy capacity. Keep in mind, that's almost one-tenth of our entire installed power sector base. Okay. In the 40 next, gigawatts in 2023. In 2024, renew a uh, financial year. And the next three months, the expectation is that a similar amount is going to get auctioned off. So we'll be auctioning off almost something like 70 to 80 gigawatts of capacity just in renewable energy in this financial year. So the government's seriousness and its intent about really pushing hard on renewables, I think, is, is very clear. Right? Now, the question is, are the state governments on board? And mm -hmm. that is, I think, an area where really a lot more work needs to happen because state governments, you know, not thinking as long term. They don't have the mandate for climate change beyond a point. So I think the central government is now trying to make RPOs, renewable purchase obligations, mandatory and really impose that as a mechanism for getting the states to play ball. I think one other thing I would say is that land acquisition is becoming a bigger and bigger problem for executing projects in India. And I think there we need some innovative solutioning. Uh, oh, it's interesting you say that because in the broader infrastructure space, one doesn't get to hear that. But you did you say that with specific reference to the renewable space? Yeah, yeah exactly. Because, uh, you know, the, the installation... Flesh it that out we, yeah. So the thing is that last year we did about 15, 20 gigawatts of installations, mm. right? Uh, in which maybe wind was 2 or 3 gigawatts. Now, if we have to do 50, 60 gigawatts every year, you wind has far, to be at least far. 10, 15 gigawatts out mm. of that, right? Because... You need that, that evenness of power generation from renewables, even though it's intermittent, mm -hmm. at least it's there 24-7. Yes. So you do need much more wind capacity to come on as well. And wind execution, just given all the issues, is very difficult. We just don't have the execution capacity for it right now. Now, <clears throat> governments really have, uh, they have um, some revenue land. There is forest land. And how can some of that sensibly, I'm not saying just give out the forest land and give out the revenue land, but how can some of that sensibly be given to corporates or industries to actually implement projects and <clears throat> do so in a way that is transparent and fair. I think that's the important thing that we have uh, to think about. One of the defining features of the last 10 years, <coughs> we try and capture that in, in a very television-friendly word, which is called Modinomics. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and the markets seem to be believing, the equity markets, uh, for example, Suman, that another five years of Modinomics are upon us. Uh, what would you like to hear from uh, not just the interim budget, but by July in terms of uh, further policy support for this sector? Well, you know, I think Modinomics has been very good, I would say, for the country as a whole, because we've now reached a point where we can aspire to have 7 to 8 percent growth on a fairly consistent basis. This has also resulted in fairly managed fiscal deficits. Through COVID, we did not inflate our fiscal deficit, as a lot of other countries did and are now paying the price for that. We were pretty pragmatic, I think, through the whole thing. And we've also used this time to deliver financial, the financial sector as a whole. The and banks are... The banks are in much more healthier a position than they were earlier, right? Uh, and then, of course, there's the whole, the whole welfare piece, which, uh, you know, in a country like India is certainly required. And then you have the digital stack as a way to get the welfare schemes. So I think there are lots of very interesting elements to Modinomics that we have not really seen in that same way before. The one thing I would like to have continue, purely from our sector standpoint, is the spend on infrastructure and the focus on infrastructure. Because ultimately, look, I think if India has to become a developed economy by, you know, whatever the target is, 2047, 
our infrastructure needs to be scaled up to a whole different level. Uh, and the concerns that, <coughs> that are valid are because when you make this point, I am reminded of the fact that uh, there are certain voices within the government uh, which are now asking how long can the government alone continue to, uh, you know, do the heavy lifting <coughs> on this. Do you think the private sector uh, can also pitch in and help reduce some of the burden on the uh, central exchequer? I think so, and I think it's already happening. Mm. If you see most of the capacity addition in renewables, for example, is happening from the private sector. The transmission uh, build-outs are happening from the private sector mostly. Of course, there are public sector companies as well, like NTPC and Power Grid and so on. But certainly, a lot of the... Uh, a lot of the capacity is getting added by both private and public sector. I think on roads, for example, uh, we have to develop the policy of cycling, recycling capital. So we need a lot of financial institutional capital to come in and uh, essentially relieve the government uh, so that they can recycle the capital. Again. And absolutely. And monetization uh, will also sort of take off some of the burden and yeah. free up resources for the government for other priority areas. Uh, so, Mansina, there's always so much to discuss at Davos, but I'm going to pause here and thank you for your time and hopefully, uh, viewers, uh, you continue to uh, hear views from some of the best and brightest uh, in India on what really are the critical business and economic issues that are being discussed here at the World Economic Forum. If you've been, thank you very much for watching. Thank you once again, Sumit. Thank you, Siddharth. Bye-bye.